Hi, I'm Tyler, and this is the Fox Valley Film Critics. In this episode of the show, we're going to be discussing the next in the lineup of the AFI's Top 100 American Movies, The Philadelphia Story, as well as the newest remake of Suspiria. Stay tuned. show brought to you by Group Think Productions and FETV. Joining us once again is Terry. For Hello. Yet another appearance. Yes, yet another one. An emergency one. At that yeah. Time, no, it worked out well though. Right oh yeah, though. totally. It's like half yeah. of the week I'm like, I don't have a guest. <laughs> <laughs> but thankfully you're always. Yeah, no, yeah, you actually. Uh, I don't want to say you're always available because it sounds sad, but it's like, yeah, I'm always available. That's help. the story of my life. Single so tier. It's all, yeah, it's all right. Yeah. Just we'll, one tier. We'll yeah. cry later. So yeah, you had you watched either of these, or the, not, not, not like either the Philadelphia story or the original Suspiria before? I've seen the original Suspiria before and I had to watch that again, but no, Philadelphia story was new. I I don't even think I really heard of it, which is surprising to me because I'm a Cary Grant fan, I'm a Jimmy Stewart fan, I like their work, and even uh, Catherine Hepburn. Um, and uh, I know George Kukora, uh, wasn't he like the King and I? And, the, and he was big, I know he was a really he big one, director. He was one of those like mid-tier dramatists from the 50s, and 40s and 50s. Yeah. Like, I know Man uh, Joseph Mankiewicz was uh, involved in this and he did All About Eve, which we okay. talked about in the show. And he did a couple other movies like that, like uh, the Julius Caesar adaption, uh, stuff like that. Like a lot of like big Hollywood, like old age of Hollywood stuff with, with those guys. And I think that that's like this movie is, it's kind of what it is. Like the it's nice. The, the what I liked about it was seeing three powerhouses in their prime: Cary Grant, Hepburn. Well, before their prime, really. Sort was of. it really okay? This was so, like thirty nine, I think. So okay, so maybe Catherine a little Hepburn, bit before. Well, Catherine Hepburn had a career before this, but Grant and Stewart were new. So. Okay, um, and well, man, Catherine Hepburn, the way she can just do that chin quiver and everything. When, uh, but uh, you know. So like I said having the three of them on there, it was it was really cool to see them work. But I got to be honest, like I like the movie, but I think this is more a movie if you're either gonna say to yourself, I'm gonna watch all the AFI top 100s, or I want to watch Cary Grant or Jimmy Stewart's catalog. As far as like standing up as a movie that I think is like kind of relevant or even still kind of one that's worth watching, I wasn't I wasn't that blown away by it. It definitely feels more aged than a lot yeah. of these movies. Like it, it's one of the I, I, my thought on it was, you can definitely tell this was an adaptation of a stage play. Okay. You see a lot with thirties and forties and fifties films that are adapted from either stage plays or books. They are very stationary and they're very talky. Mm -hmm. Like there's not a lot of like complex filmmaking going on here. It's they just they filmed a play. Yeah. So it it so it's all performance and dialogue driven, which it, which are on their own. They're fine. Like, this is a great movie. This the script is. It has all the wit that everyone yeah. talks about it, where these characters, they just talk, they're, they're funny people, they're charismatic. No one's ever this charismatic in real life, but it's great in a movie. Mm -hmm. And the story behind it's kind of fascinating. So by 39, uh, Hepburn was effectively, she'd been ousted by MGM. I think her contract had been violated, so they, they, they prematurely ended her contract. And she was friends with Howard Hughes, if you've seen The Aviator. Yes. She, she's played in Howard Hughes, and she is so weird. Like... I was just like, I, I wasn't, I, apparently I'm not the only one who thought this, but I was just watching the movie last night and like, Catherine Hepburn acts a lot like Cersei Lannister. I don't know why. But, <laughs> and I went on, I started looking at reviews this morning and then someone else said that too. And I'm like, okay, so it's not just me, but she'd alienated herself cause, just because she had this reputation of being like a snob and bratty. And, yeah. And so Hughes bought the rights to the stage play, The Philadelphia Story. And then she gained the system and went to MGM was like, Hey, I have a critically su successful Broadway play. If you let me star in it, I'll let you make it. And then they let her. <laughs> oh, so oh, there you go. She, so she earned her. She for, she forced her way back into Hollywood, <laughs> and it ended up being like the fourth or fifth most highest grossing film of that year. So. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, because I know I didn't know that about her being ousted. Because I know she wasn't one of her last films on Golden Pond. Was that? When was that? God, that was in the '70s. Because Henry Fonda was already in his '70s when they did that. Um, so, because I know Catherine Hepburn had a long career. Well, I think she, I think she just kind of prematurely got ousted when she was young, and she just kind okay. of forced her way back in. But after that, she I don't think she had any problems. Okay. Well, I was gonna say with her being weird. I mean, if uh, 
Scorsese's portrayal of her family in The Aviator was like pretty true, which I know he does <laughs> his homework. It's it's not hard to realize why she was weird, but um, so I mean, like the plot of it is, uh, her and Cary Grant are married, and the the, the beginning is funny because like she's it just starts with him leaving the house, and you can tell something's wrong because he slams the door. And he's got his suitcases, so you're like, okay, he's leaving in a tiff. And then she comes out and drops his pipe holder and breaks a golf club over her knee, which is pretty funny. And then, um, speaking of aged, this is, uh, like I said, like we said <laughs> earlier, only a movie from this area can take uh, domestic abuse and make it a light, like a lighthearted comedy, because he just walks up to her and grabs her by the face and throws her into the back end of the door, and it's just like, oh! <laughs> and, but there was, a, you know, that's the other thing, too. I think um, in this day and age, like this kind of, the way that we are now, this movie might even be offensive, which is funny because the Uncle Willie was, that character was funny. He was just a, a rich, basically louse or lush, a rich lush who was just drunk all day and said smirky things. But, you know, then the photographer and he's always goosing the photographer and everything. And it's like, it's like, yeah, maybe in the 40s this would be worth a laugh. But now it's kind of like, Ooh. It's colored by the fact that that was, the film was essentially financed by Hepburn. So... If she if she's willing to be thrown to the ground through the for, for her art, I can respect that. Yeah, okay. It's like a joke. I was listening yeah. to a love series uh, yesterday, and character is explaining why did you why did you write a script where your character is getting peed on, and then his response was the question is how much will you pay me to be peed on? <laughs> you're, gonna, you're gonna go well in this business. Yeah, that's true. That's so it's one of those things like maybe, maybe this is like her way of being modest. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, again, like I said, it, it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was, I could see why it was in the top 100, but I wouldn't say it was one of my favorites of that list. This is, I, this is definitely like a boomer love. Yeah. Too. It's like that, the, the older generation is like, I love the Philadelphia story. I don't, I don't want to beat up on boomers. Yeah, but, well, Jimmy, uh, when Jimmy Stewart got drunk on champagne, that was actually, that was actually a pretty funny part, like, what, like watching Jimmy, I don't know if he was really drunk <laughs> or if he was just pretending, this but. This is an apocalypse now. Yeah, that's true. So, these so, are method actors. That's right. So he was pretending to be drunk and watching him, watching him pretend to be drunk on champagne was actually pretty entertaining. Uh, but like I said, the little girl that played Dinah, I don't know the actress's name, um, her spot in the film was, it was pretty. The little bratty little girl? Yeah, it was, her, it was like, she was okay in that, like, it was kind of like, okay, I can see her kind of comic relief side. It's like, oh, a cute little girl that acts like a grown-up. You know, nice, we've seen it before. Well, but maybe not in this time, but, then. yeah, but not then, yeah, but. Uh, oh, wow, she is really impressively talented, and she's also a brat. <laughs> but, I mean, like, as far as. I guess Catherine, like Catherine Hepburn had the most changing of character, I guess. Like the whole thing is about her finding herself, be going through these things and growing as a person. But uh, I mean, Cary Grant stayed Cary Grant. Jimmy Stewart, he ends up having an epiphany at the end with the photographer. The moral of the story is, if you're a domestic abuser, the woman has to change for you. Yeah, pretty much, right? Yeah, thank you, <laughs> thank you, 1940s. Uh, but yeah, it was, um, I said, it. It wasn't a terrible watch. I just wouldn't rank it as one of my favorites off of the AFI 100 list. I think yeah, it's one I, that I, I saw it and as I'm, I said, I'm good. It feels stagey. It, it's it's like anti-millennial. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and, and and Grant and Stewart and even Hepburn, they they have far better movies than this that I think are worth they're I mean, worth watching. I think Mr. Smith Goes to Washington was that year too. So that wouldn't I wouldn't even say this is the best Jimmy Stewart movie. Yeah, that year. yeah. So. Uh, and you know, and I, and I said, like I said, I heard of George Cukor, but I don't think I've really seen, other than this, I don't know if I've seen any other, any of his other films. Yeah, me neither. I mean, I, this is, there's a certain, this is a certain kind of film that they made. As yeah. Him and, him and Mankiewicz. Yeah, okay. So, but yeah, no, it's, I said it's. It's like nowadays when they, you see those Oscar movies that are like, they're like, I'm making it as an homage to the old age of Hollywood. Yeah. Like Cukor and, her, and Mankiewicz, those are the guys that they're referencing, so. Yeah. But I mean, if you want to, La La Land is just nothing but ripping off this. Oh, is it really? Yeah, <laughs> no, not, not like La literally, La but like that kind of old romanticism. Okay, that's what I say. Yeah, if you want to see, if you want to like watch it because it's on the AFI 100, or if you're like I said, if you're just a fan of any of the actors or even the director, it's worth a watch. But it's probably one that, like, for me personally, it's like I saw it once. I probably never would have seen it unless if it wasn't for this. And having seen it, like I said, it's like okay, I saw it once. I bought the Criterion Collection, so I have to justify watching it multiple yeah. times. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah, 
to cover that Criterion price. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Criterion Collection. It's like the movie, that, like, what is it? Like, all the, it's like, with three extra hours of stuff. You could spend a week just going through Criterion Blu-ray most times. So. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Remember, kids, it's Criterion Month at Barnes & Noble. <laughs> Get yours half off. So what did, I know you kind of explained, what, like, was there anything you really liked about it or disliked? Uh, I mean, I, I said my point. It's, it, it, def, it, doesn't, it doesn't appeal to younger sensibilities, which I don't know if that's a fault with young people or if it's just reality. Okay. It's one of those things where people, like young people, like they just don't groove on older movies all that well. And I've heard, and I'm, I have two minds on it. On one, I'm like those dang kids. Yeah. But on the other hand, I'm just like, well, it's, it's their brain chemistry. It's been wired by a generation of being involved in the internet and having instant pop tarts. Mm -hmm. so it's these things. It's these things that they they mess with your brain chemistry, and it's not entirely your fault. But that's actually that's actually a really good point because I I feel the same way when I hear the the. Uh, like you said, those darn kids. When I hear them say things like, "Oh, well, you know," it's like every every time you you just mention black and white, it's like oh, black and white, a black and white movie. That's so old. It's like, oh my god. It's like there's really the you know there's really good black and white movies, but this movie actually kind of proves that it. point. Yeah, it, it like well, like it's, why it's, am I gonna watch this outdated black and white it's movie? It's a completely different sensibility. Yeah. It, but I mean, obviously, if you are young you should try to get through these films because they're they're good for you mm -hmm. that's all the time we have for this segment join us for the following segment we'll be discussing the remake of Suspiria stay tuned well, now, welcome back time to talk about Suspiria so what are your thoughts on this my thoughts on the remake of Suspiria so First of all, thank you for making me go see this movie because I wouldn't have seen it otherwise. Because uh, anytime they do a horror remake, I'm always a little bit like, okay. So I went and saw it, and uh, I, I, you know, when I first when the movie was first over, I wasn't sure what I thought about it. Um, but then the more I thought about it, the more I really liked it. I kind of liked everything about this movie. Yeah, I would completely agree. I mean, this is this movie is. I, I there was a lot of like apprehension about this movie when I when I know the trailer came out earlier this mm -hmm. year, and a lot of people were like, "Oh no, it looks nothing like the original one. Where's all the color?" And I'm just like, "Okay, let, let's step back. I don't know what this is. I've never seen the original Suspiria, so I waited. I wondered where it was going to come out. I watched the original one, which is visually spectacular and almost impossible to follow. Yes, <laughs> yes, and then. Uh, went to the, see the sequel. It actually opened near us. I thought I was going to drive all the way into Chicago to see it, which thankfully wasn't the case. It actually got a modicum of a decent release to it. And I was completely like engaged with it. Same here. Uh, it's the pacing of it was, I think, really well done. Um, it's very long, but it's also, but it's not deliberately paced, so it doesn't feel boring. No, and it's always yeah, because just about. I really like there's parts where just about when it gets boring, they give you like a little cookie where it's like, where it's like, all right, all right, it's dragging. And then like something mysterious happens where you're like, okay, all right, now things are starting to come, things are kind of starting to come together here. Um, the movie's also way less coy than the first one is. Like, yeah. it tells you right at the front, this is what it's about. It's about a witch coven. Yeah. It's about a witch coven of dancers. Yeah. And, and then it, so it, it's the, it just kind of milks the suspense of, you know what these characters don't know, and you're just getting dragged along watching the, the mm -hmm. things happen. So I think that helps a lot. I think the the color change to being muted, it, 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 correl it also correlates to the fact that this movie is also way more overtly historical than the first yes. one. So there's a lot of references to contemporary politics in Berlin and well, yeah, hostage crisis. The, the, yeah. the wall was the wall played a big part in it. The Berlin uh, Wall. Mm -hmm. It, it feels like it's actually addressing what life was in this time. So it, it's planting it, it's taking the original Suspiria story and planting it in real life and just kind of letting the, the strains of the story follow that. And I think that's super, a super interesting way to do a remake. It's like yeah. a completely different way to approach the subject material. Well, I think that too, like, as far as remake, this, it's a remake in the sense that they redid the story and kind of kept the same characters' names because um, Dakota Johnson plays Susie Banyan, which was the name of the character in the first one. But I think it's almost a new movie in a way. Basically, we're basically in the thing territory of remakes. Like, yeah. It, take the concept and just rewrite it completely and just 
fill in the gaps of all the major plot points. Mm -hmm. and, and like we said, I, I did, I wanted to uh, cross-reference the original Suspiria, so I watched it after seeing that. And like you said, it's very hard to follow, visually stunning. I mean, it's got one of the most famous like kill scenes in all horror movies in the very beginning. But other than that, you're kind of like at the end, you're kind of like, what did I just watch? Yeah, I didn't even catch the wit the witch part of it when I was watching it with, with a friend of mine. He's like, Yeah. What? And that and that to me see, I think if Dario Argento had the money and the technology in the seventies, the end of this Suspiria is the end that I think he would have liked to done because the end of the original Suspiria, there's really nothing. Well it's I mean there's something, but it's like I, the credit the movie uh, is credited partially to Dario Argento, so I'm wondering if this was a different version of his script. It's it's possible. I don't know. Yeah, I know this. I know the director of this is a completely different has a completely different voice. Yeah, than, uh, Dario Argento because I I forget his name. Luca Luca San Gu Guglielmo or Gugli yeah yeah, yeah so something did, like that. He did Call Me by Your Name, which got a lot of awards last year. And his movies are obviously there's ob there is obviously a lot of like sexual themes involved mm -hmm. in his work, and you can see that here in here. So he's a little he's trying to explore like the dynamics of these characters in a little more in a more of a overtly sociological or political way than I think Argento was. I mean, I mean there's like, there's literally quotes of Argento is, uh, where he's like, well, if you're going to murder someone, you might as well murder someone pretty. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, oh, God. And, just, and, uh, Arge and uh, this director is just like, I'm going to think about what that means. Well, he, he, you know, it's like, I was going to say too, a part of it, if you, uh, even if you're not, because the story is long. Um, yes. But, the end makes up for anything. And if you like exploding heads without giving away too much of it, if you like exploding heads, you will love the end of this movie. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Because yes. it was just nonstop for at least five minutes of the ending. Well, that ending sequence is so long. Like, it, yeah. It, 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 they, I don't want to say what happens, but it, it, there's so much repetition in the shots, and it just takes forever to get to the point. But it, mm -hmm. it's, try, it's just like very alluring to watch. And I think before we... Uh, Run out of time. The the one thing that we have to really talk about too is what I think made this movie even better was uh, Tilda Swinton. Tilda Swinton is just she awesome. She is spectacular. And I didn't realize until I, as I was so interested in the movie, uh, to it's not giving away anything, but she played the psychiatrist. She plays multiple roles. I yeah, but there was but that that was one of the things they said. Other than the two police officers, this was like an all female cast. Wow, that's fascinating. And yeah. I, I didn't even catch that she was like, psychi the psychiatrist. Me neither, until I read about it. I wonder if that's an artistic statement. <laughs> I think, yeah, because she was actually quoted when they, uh, she kept saying no, but what they found out was the name that she used for, that she, the uh, pseudonym she created for the actor, his last name, uh, I forget what the last name was, but it basically, in German, it translates to um, uh, Swine Town, which, like Swinton. <laughs> So, so when they finally asked her, oh, okay, are you playing the actor who plays this guy? She said, yes. And when they asked her why, she said, well, as my grandmother always said, why not for the fun of it? <laughs> so, and, and, that, and that just goes to show how awesome she is because it's like she just played a man because she could. And with a, th with a thick German accent. Yeah. But I, I did not catch that. Like, Me neither. That's, I, I was like, who, who played the doctor? I've never seen this guy before. And that was, uh, but yeah, no, that, like I said, the pacing of the movie can really get you drawn out. And, you know, when we were talking about Dario Gento, the, uh, the death of Olga went on for far too... It wasn't well, bad. So was, she was the girl who dies in the studio, right? Yes, where she's doing all the ballet okay, so and contorting. I and will say, this, the first Suspiria has a very famous death. This movie is like, hold my beer. Just, yeah. Like, it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's, I'm going to find the most gruesome, yeah. painful way to kill someone possible. Yeah. And, and that was it. Yeah, like that... I don't. I, that's not the worst death I've seen in a film. The worst death is all. I will always say is Bone Tomahawk. Yeah, you've told the yeah, bisection you mentioned, scene. You've mentioned that. I haven't seen it yet. I don't recommend it. No. But, but I love that director. He's. I love. I love Brawl and Cellblock 99, but I do not recommend Bone Tomahawk. But this is. This throws the that death scene for a, a spin because. Yeah. Just, like, I, I, I don't even want to describe it because it's just spectacular to watch, especially it, if you don't expect it. Yeah, and it was actually really cool. And like I said, it's like just when you're thinking to yourself like. It's got to be over. You're like, nope, it's not over. <laughs> it's like, well, there's, that, there's that, more. The sequence, it's purposely long because it's yeah. be, it needs to be brutal. And it? it's slow, yeah. like really slow. Like, like, oh my God, like poor Olga. You oh. should have just stayed in class, Olga. <laughs> like, why did you want to leave? Right. But no, I said, 
it's what I think they say uh, two and a half hours, so it's all it's an hour longer than the original. Yeah, because the first one's like ninety minutes. But this one far better than the original. You, is, you would go that far and say it's better? Yes, I think this. I think I think if you're going to get into Suspiria, and I didn't know that uh, Suspiria Dario Argento was basically his Three Mothers trilogy. So there's two other movies, and yeah, there's I've heard Inferno of that. and The Mother of Tears. So I don't know if they're going to try and redo that. That'd be fascinating because, I, well, uh, I mean, it, with the ending, I, I don't know how that correlates with the ending of the original film or mm. to what degree there's room for sequels, but we'll see. I mean, I would, I'd be fine with this director having a franchise. Yeah, and that's why I said. It, watch the original Suspiria to kind of get Dario Gento's original vision of it, but if you want to get into Suspiria... This one would probably be a much more entertaining one where you kind of feel like, ah, because said that Dario Argento one, visually stunning, but it was just, it, it was that weird, like, almost like, like Luke Godard type, just weird, hard, to, like that weird Italian French cinema, you know, where it was just like bright, vibrant colors, but the story made absolutely no sense. It just kind of jumped all over. Well, that's the thing. Like, I'm, I don't want to jump to conclusion and say that the first one is lesser just because I didn't understand it. I, I, the fact that I, that I found it difficult makes me want to understand it more. Not that it's a bad movie inherently, but I th obviously I think the first one's more of a, a visual storytelling experience than it is a story, which I think, it, which is to its benefit. This, one's, this one has a little bit, is a little bit more conventional, which for, depending on the person may or may not make it better. I know there's some people that are really just not getting into this movie because they're, they're critic, there are some critics that are like, this is like one of the best films of the year, and there are some critics that are like, I didn't understand any of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the thing, like, it gives you the background, but it doesn't tell you the story. Like, I'm still, did, I have, I, I'm kind of of the mind that, like, Susie Banyan's character was basically there. To, I don't know if she was going to, like, form with the matron of the coven, or if she was supposed to just join the coven and yeah, they were supposed to steal what, her essence. It's I, not I, clear what the actual goal of the coven yeah, is. Yeah, with her. I, I is, don't know. Which is fine. It's, I don't mind it being, it being a little cryptic. Yeah. I mean, obviously, it's one of those, it might be one of, the, one of those things where it's just buried in dialogue. Like, maybe there's some offline earlier in the movie that's like, and eh, this is our entire plan. We're just yeah. right here. Anyway, back to the plot. And then the, uh, the, one, of the one of the coven matrons that, not, that she's... She's there, but she never talks. Like, I, I was always kind of like, I was waiting for her to, like, grab Susie and be like, this is what they're going to do. But she, I'm not going to give away what she does to get her out of the story. But it's like, then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, when, like, that the dinner scene, and she just, I guess I can give it away without doing too much, right? We actually, we got to go. So oh, okay. Then That's all the time we have for this segment. Uh, join us for the final segment. We'll be discussing his movie recommendation for the week. Stay tuned. Hello, welcome back. We're going to hand things over to Terry for his movie recommendation of this week. Thank you. Uh, I was going through my DVD dustbin, <laughs> and I uh, came across uh, Oliver Stone's 1991 film, The Doors. Uh, Explain to me the appeal. <laughs> so, I was, when I was in college, I was a huge Doors fan. Loved The Doors. Uh, I was introduced to him like in high school. Loved The Doors. And uh, got into the whole myth of Jim Morrison. Uh, you know, enigmatic front man of the doors, lived in the 60s, the sex, drugs, rock and roll, said a lot of profound things, and like people followed his music, he was a poet, all these things died, joined the 27 Club, died at the age of 27, then uh, that, was, that was it. Um, and the appeal of this was one, you got Val Kilmer when he was in his prime. Ooh. So Val Kilmer is Jim Morrison, spot on. Uh, and the thing that I liked a lot about this is it's, um, I'm going to say it's a love story, but not the movie. It was basically a love story between Oliver Stone and Jim Morrison. Because uh, when, uh, when I read the thing about the, Oliver Stone was introduced to the Doors when he was in Vietnam. And he really got intrigued by Jim Morrison and everything about it. So this was a movie that he wanted to make. And he teamed up with Ray Manzarek. And uh, it was really funny. It was really cool because like, uh, they were you know, auditioning and stuff. And they got a demo tape from Val Kilmer pretending to be Jim Morrison and singing a song and Ray Manzarek's like that's Jim Morrison he's like that he sounds like him every that's Jim Morrison um and the thing that I like about this is you know a lot of like the the music movies that are coming out now about musicians it's always there's always like 
it always starts out that they're poor in like some rustic town and then a brother or a relative dies and then they're they're like the le the least loved kid and they go on to have this great music career and it's they're like all, they're all straight out of Compton ripoffs. Yeah, it's like how many how many musicians did this actually happen to? And, <laughs> <laughs> and but this Oliver Stone like basically uh, picks up with uh, Jim Morrison basically being a UCLA student. Uh, and then it goes to when they start first start the doors, and then they get big, and then it, you know, it's, it's it's basically just about his life. And I think he portrayed Jim Morrison's life really well. He kind of brings the myth onto the screen that was Jim Morrison, and um, and and again, Oliver Stone, especially in the early '90s, Oliver Stone was just one of those powerhouse directors. Pretty much anything Oliver Stone put out in the '90s, because I think this was right after Platoon. Was that '90s or '80s? I think that was 80s. The, yeah, so Platoon was 80s. This was 91. Uh, didn't Oliver Stone do Wall Street too? Wasn't he did it? both Wall Streets. Yeah, okay. So that so Oliver Stone had a really good thing. And this was a movie that he just really, you could tell he really wanted to make because, like I said, he loved The Doors and he loved the whole myth about Jim Morrison. So this was really uh, not only about The Doors, but it was more about Jim Morrison himself. Who And, and I think that this movie is actually going to be relevant today because I think a lot of people especially college students, tend to get in to Jim Morrison and The Doors. Uh, the Doors are one of those bands that always kind of go through right when you're getting like late teens, early 20s, they just seem to connect with a lot of people. Um, and Jim Morrison's words also connect with a lot of people too. So the music is one thing, but if you want to understand Morrison and The Doors, the Oliver Stone does a really good job of this movie. It was one of my favorite movies in college. I watched it all the time. That's all the time we have for this episode of the show. Uh, you can find past recordings of the show on the Group Think Productions YouTube page. You can find more of my written reviews at Geeks Under Grace. And you can find more, uh, uh, more of the... Uh, oh, and you can follow me on Twitter at AntiSocialCredi. That's Critics with C at the end. I'm Tyler with the Fox Valley Film Critics. Have a wonderful day.